Hello and welcome into another episode of Popcorn for Breakfast. We have a very interesting show for you today. We are going to be reviewing an HBO Max original movie for the very first time uh, called The Little Thing, starring three Oscar winners in Denzel Washington, Jared Leto, and Rami Malek. We have actually quite a bit of movie news to get you caught up on from the last week and... In honor of the little things, we are going to wrap up the show with our schoolyard pick of little things. It's going to be very interesting. We got no time to waste. Let's get right into it. Thank you for joining us on another episode of Popcorn for Breakfast. With me, as always, your co-host, Kirk. Hello, hello. And as always, I am your other co-host, Cam. This is Old Hat by now for all you loyal listeners out there. We know we know you've been with us from day one, and we just want to say we appreciate you. If you're new to the show, welcome. We have a lot of fun on this podcast. We do spoiler-free movie reviews. We get you all caught up on movie and television news, of which there is quite a bit these days, which is a nice change of pace. And we have a little fun. We have a little fun on this podcast, too. Wouldn't you say, Kirk? Just a little fun. Not too much fun. No. Because we, we don't, don't want to go too be, far. We're not comedians, but um, you know, there's a little flair of, of excitement that comes around now and then a couple of times. A maximum of three times per episode, I would say. Yeah, I mean, we... Yes. I, we're not the fun police. We don't want to go, but we don't want to go too hard. You know what I mean? You don't want to, don't want to no. go too wild. Um, I said interesting episode this week. I think it is interesting. I think we've got an interesting movie, The Little Things. I'm, I'm excited to review it. I'm excited to get your thoughts on it. Um, because as always, we never speak about it. And with movies like these that like release straight to streaming, I a lot of times feel like I'm the only one who's seen it because we watch it like right away, and everybody else kind of has to like catch up um but this is i guess other than wonder woman 1984 this is the first movie that we have reviewed that's part of this warner slate of films that is releasing in theaters at the same time as it's releasing on hbo max so that's a that's an interesting change of pace as well it is. It is. I'm so thankful because while I love the movie theater, there is a slew of movies that are coming out that we're going to have to watch that I only want to watch from my living room. So uh, we'll we'll determine if this was one of them or not later on in this episode. But, yeah. you know, not all episodes, not all sh- movies have to be seen in the theater, uh, even though there's a big push for that. So I yeah. agree. I mean, I think I think in this day and age, there are movies that you're like. Yes, I have to see that in theater. But there are other movies where you don't. I mean, there there are plenty. I mean, you can't tell me, like, there aren't indie films that can be viewed at home. I mean, for sure. In fact, in some cases, it feels slightly more appropriate to watch them at home yes. whenever it's, like, a really intimate movie, like a very personal story or something like that. I think in some cases, that feels like a little bit better vibe. In other movies, you know, the Chris Nolan brand of movies, the, you know, the... uh the Marvel brand of movies, that's a different story. And and those are something that I miss. I miss the theater for. And I'm glad that we got to go see Tenet in theaters because that's exactly the kind of movie you want to see in theaters. That's right. It feels when it's more of that indie movie, more of your short term 12, you know, it feels like it's yours. It feels like a discovery that you just want to hold dear, uh, near and dear to yourself. But yeah, Tenet, I want to see every inch of aspect ratio. Oh, so yeah. give me that up on the screen. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Definitely. Um, I'm happy with where, where we're headed in 2021. I have to say like just in general, the vibe feels different, which I was not expecting just in the movie industry alone. Um, there's more news. There's more movies. I mean, we're, we're at the point now where I like, I can see a couple weeks in ahead, like what we're going to be reviewing, what we're going to be watching, which is really nice. Um, because in 2020, I mean, we were doing biweekly reviews and it was a grind. It was like, what are we going to, what are we going to review? There's nothing out there. Yeah. Sometimes it was 
tri-weekly. <laughs> we're like, ooh, I don't know, I know this week. <laughs> I know. So I'm glad we're out of that zone. I'm glad we've got lots of movie news. It seems like the studios, the executives, they're getting back to a point where they're like, all right, we can start to see the future a little bit too. And it feels like there's a light at the end of this tunnel. We can announce new shows, new movies. And that's like, I live for that. I, in a lot of ways, I feel like I live for the movie news more than the movies sometimes. Absolutely, man. It, it's such a weird thing. I, I hope there are other people out there like us that, that do the same because I could just sit there for hours looking at all of the upcoming movies for people. Uh, maybe it's just I, I'm just insatiable with movies, but no, I feel I that I feel know. the same way with sports too. I um, I'm like one of these weird people who's like, oh, the season's over, what a bummer. But I'm like, but free agency is now beginning. I think <laughs> the reason for that is the hope, like the the unknown, the anticipation. That's really like what we thrive on as human beings is is yes. the anticipation. It's like you always want the new thing. You always want the PS5, but like wanting the PS5 and like waiting to get the PS5 is almost better than the PS5 in a lot, in a lot of ways. It's true because the idea can't let you down when it freezes or it breaks or whatever. Yeah, yeah absolutely. All right. Well, like I said, we have a lot to get to. I mean, I know it's early in the episode, but I kind of think we should just dive right into what's popping. How are you feeling about that, Kirk? Yeah, I think that's great. Are we starting with Army Hammer's cannibalism or are we skipping right over that? Oh, I don't even. I. <laughs> wow. I hit the sounder like right whenever <laughs> you said that. I don't know how to react to this story, dude. And it's like a couple weeks old and I have intentionally stayed away from it because it's like, <laughs> first of all, bizarre. Yes, like, it's so bizarre. And also, like, what a weird thing that's, like, probably not true. And if it is true, like, I don't even want to know that it's true. Here's here's the process of hearing the Army Hammer story. You see Army Hammer's trending. You're like, okay, he's either in some other bad movie because he curses all movies besides the social network. <laughs> That's phase one. Okay. Like, oh, he's being can He's he's either uh, he's in a bad movie or he's being canceled. Phase two, you're like, oh, he must have done something horrible to a woman. Yeah. Easy. Phase three, you read that he has cannibalistic thoughts, and everything you ever thought about the world goes out the window. <laughs> True. It, that that was quite a left hook. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I was I went through that same process. I'm like, oh, Army Hammer's trending. I'm gonna. Click into that. I, you know, some na- sometimes nowadays, first of all, Twitter trends have gotten especially strange recently. Yeah, I would yeah. say in general, just like like today, I, I don't know, like a couple of days ago, um, like you just get like random Marvel characters trending on Twitter, and you go and click on it, and there's like no news. It's just like people, like twenty five thousand people talking about it for some reason. Like, yes. why? Um, it's just it's bizarre. Um, I forgot what was trending the other day that I almost posted because I was like, why is this even a thing? It was like Squidward or something like that. I don't know. It's it's just it's getting weird on Twitter. I think people have like totally lost their minds in quarantine and they're and they're just like talking about whatever. It's like a therapy session. Um, they're screaming, Mista, Mista, get me <laughs> Yeah. So like at first I was like, maybe this is gonna be one of those Twitter trends where people just randomly decide to drag him for no reason just drag army hammer like through the mud because people do that. Sometimes they'll be like, Hey, this person sucks. Let's all tweet about how much this person sucks. And so I was like kind of thinking it was going to be that. And so then whenever I got on there and it was like the cannibalism thing, I was like, huh? Yeah. I read like 18 different reports to verify it. (laughs) Same because I was like so confused about it. It's very, it's very strange. And then I was like, this is almost certainly not true. And at least in my brain, I'm like, I will not allow this to be true in my head. And then I was like, man, what a terrible thing. Imagine you're like, imagine it's not true, which I'm, I'm going to say like, I know you're like Mr. Conspiracy Theory over there, but I'm like 95% this is not true. Imagine That's you're true. Army Hammer and you're just like, la di da 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 let's over the internet. Let's see what's <laughs> going on. Your publicist is call, has called you 25 times and you check your voicemail and you check Twitter and people think you're cannibal. Like that's how you start your, your day. It's like Tuesday (laughs) and that's how you start your day. I would be, I would just quit everything. I think he did. Like he put a movie on hold because he was like, 
I need to be with my family while this weird crap is going on. And I'm like, man, yeah. what, what a kids, day. Uh, Daddy doesn't eat people. Um, <laughs> although I think he really does, oh, Cam. Gosh, I don't know. I, I, I am not going to feed the, the fire. I need hard evidence. I need partially eaten people to mm. come out and say <laughs> I have been eaten by Army Hammer. That's what I mm. I'm I'm going to set up uh, an interview with you and Army Hammer for like a one week getaway in some remote area yeah. and no phones and we'll see if you survive. Yeah, I mean I like my chances. I think Yeah. I think there's a good chance I kill him. <laughs> in that scenario also speaking of interviews i'm pretty sure you just squandered any chance at a future interview with army hammer that we could have ever had so thanks for that because you just said that he ruins every movie so you started off with that that you believe he is a cannibal yes and many other things but those were the two big ones and so i feel like at some point, uh, when we're big, there's going to be an opportunity to interview Army Hammer, and he's going to go back through and like search the metadata for Army Hammer and listen to this conversation, mm. and he's going to be like, screw these guys. Uh, I stand by all of my previous statements. Just just want to put that out there. Do not do not want to interview Army Hammer. <laughs> Goodbye, sir. <laughs> all right. Well, I mean, that's that's that. And frankly, I was not going to talk about the Army Hammer cannibalism thing, but maybe we <laughs> maybe we should post about it now. I was like trying to stay far away from it but now that we've spoken it into the universe i think we have a right to tell the people what's going on so you know we've kept silent about it for too long and (laughs) now it's time to speak i don't think there's ever such thing as being silent for too long on absurd cannibalism claims i don't know i just think like Mm. you can stay away from those in general so no statute of limitations (laughs) on cannibalism yes got it correct okay now to the real stories unless you believe that that's true. Um, This is a weird week, okay? This is a weird week in the world. You know how people say, like, maybe there's a full moon or something. I think there's been a full moon for, like, a week and a half, at least. Mm -hmm. Because with all the Wall Street, are you following all this with with GameStop and AMC and the the Reddit trolls are buying up all the stock and the hedge fund managers are getting mad? It's a whole thing. Mm -hmm, Um, mm Mm-hmm. Well, that whole saga, which let's just let's just timeline this for a second. We released an episode last Wednesday. So we were recording a week ago today. None of this stuff that I'm about to, that I just mentioned with Wall Street had started. Okay. Since that time, it has like taken over the entire internet. And Kirk, here's where the movie news comes in. Deadline is reporting that there are already two films in the works about last week's events, about the craziness going on with Reddit people, um, you know, successfully manipulating the market. Whoa. And one of them is, has the rights were acquired. Okay. So MGM acquired the rights to a book by Ben Mesrich, which if that name sounds familiar, he's the guy who wrote the book that the social network was, was based off of. And yes. so he hasn't even written this book yet because, again, this <laughs> happened last week. And he's already like, I'm going to write a book. And MGM's like, we want the rights to that book and we're going to turn it into a movie. And, like, the working title right now is The Anti-Social Network, which I hate, by the That's way. That's brilliant. I hate that title. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, I hate it because I hate, that it's, I hate that it's derivative of The Social Network. And I don't want to live in a world where we have a movie called The Social Network, which I love, and a movie called The Anti-Social Network based on books by the same guy. Like, I just hate, I hate all of that. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe that's just me. Maybe it's just me. I just think it's a, I think it's a cop-out title. I hope they come up with something better. I think it's just work, working title just for publicity. It has to be. Yeah. Because once again, it hasn't even been a week. Um, and the that's other one... Than- Tiger King. Yeah, it is. And the other one, um, Netflix is like already casting people for this other. It's like either I can't tell if it's a movie or a show. I'm like, this is wild. And like, 
we don't even know the end of this story yet, really. I mean, there are still people out there, like, holding on to stocks and trying to keep the market, like, where it's at for as long as possible. So we have no idea how this ends. We don't know if, like, the SEC is going to intervene or, like, what's going to happen. But there's already two movies in the works. So that's uh, that's new for me. I was very surprised to hear that, actually. That is nuts. Trying to see what the game stop stock. Ooh, it dropped real low. It was like three twenty five on Friday. Now it's down to ninety dollars. Oh boy, for sure. Oh boy. So maybe maybe we're getting close to the end of that story. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I know people. I mean, I would have done the same. I would have sold if I owned it. I'm too risk averse to get involved in any of this stuff. But I can tell you, like probably on like Saturday or maybe Friday of last week, I would have been selling it. <laughs> and if I already owned it, I would have sold it long ago. So um, I feel really yeah. bad for any like poor saps that bought into the Reddit thing. We're like, we're going to hold strong forever. And then everybody else sold and they got stuck holding the hot potato, which was obviously going to happen. But I feel sorry for those people still. Yeah. Sad days, weird days and sad days. Yes. Um, okay, moving along. And we've got lots of different movie news. Here's what I'm really excited about, Kirk, to be honest. And you know, actually both of us are big superhero movie guys. We love it. Mm-hmm. We live for the superheroes. We live for the big franchises. We we love it. But we have a good chunk of movie news this week for the first time in a long time that is not in the superhero realm, I would say. Um so that to me is good news. It's kind of like <sighs> breath of fresh air a little bit, a little, little, little change of pace here. So a couple of things that, first of all, this one I'm really excited about. Noah Baumbach, who is one of the great writers and filmmakers that we have, indie filmmaker. He um, created Marriage Story, wrote and directed it, which was a huge hit at the Oscars last year for Netflix. He uh, wrote Francis Ha. He's written on some uh, Wes Anderson movies like The Life Aquatic and Fantastic Mr. Fox. So he's really a gifted writer and creator. He has signed an exclusive multi-year deal with Netflix to continue to create movies for them. Wow. And I see this as like Netflix once again reaffirming like, yeah, we're going to give you the junk food movies. We are. We're going to give you the Six Undergrounds, the... Uh, Triple Frontiers. The what was this one that we just watched with Anthony Mackie? What was that one called? Oh, Outside the uh, Wire. Yes. We're, we're going to give you that those movies, and we're going to give you true crime documentaries. Like so many true crime documentaries, your eyes will bleed. But we also want to contend for Oscars because I mean Noah Baumbach is that caliber of a filmmaker, and to sign him to an exclusive deal means that they are committed to. Mixing in some really high quality movies with their junk food, I think. So I'm definitely, excited about definitely. that. They've got Adam Sandler, <laughs> Adam Sandler on lock, and now <laughs> no bump. Yeah. Did they get uncut gems because of the deal with Adam Sandler? Do you know? Because I think they have I, uncut I gems. Don't know. Don't they? I don't know if that was tied. They do. They do have it right now together, or if it's strictly coincidence because Netflix will ultimately have every big movie. Um, that comes through. <laughs> yeah. Any any big movie that's like not Disney anymore is like going through the Netflix chain. Um, I don't know. What <laughs> is Uncut Gems a Happy Madison production? <laughs> <laughs> if so, I that would be so. hilarious. I would love up. I would love to see that like flashed at the front of this. I, I don't think it was. I think it was like A24. And it was the Safety brothers who directed it, obviously. But I was just wondering like, does their deal with Adam Sandler state that anything he is in for the rest of forever, that's what it feels like. Anything you are in for the like rest of forever stake. will go to Netflix. Yeah, They just have actually uh, stock invested in uh, Adam Sandler, it, just him as a person. Mm, yeah. So it doesn't even go to his production company. <laughs> right. And I think that if Adam Sandler gets too old to the point where like he can't do movies anymore, they will clone him and create a new Adam Sandler. They will like rapid accelerate growth him into an adult again and then continue to churn out movies. That's my, that's my theory. (laughs) I don't know. 
It's, I don't uh, know if we'll live know, to see I, it, but... I thought... I know you had difficulty believing the cannibalism thing, but uh, now you're dropping this stuff on us, so I don't know where you stand anymore. I would say that theory that I just dropped is easily just as plausible as the army hammer cannibalism. I almost said more plausible, but I didn't want to go there. Mm, Okay. (laughs) We'll see. We'll see what plays out as truth, Cameron. (laughs) We will. We truly will. We will. Um, Okay. More movie news. That's sort of in that same arena. We got some acquisition news here and Apple's getting in on it. You know, Apple, they continue to spend Lots and lots of money on their catalog, which, well, I mean, let's be honest. You and I have been pretty critical of their catalog, their television shows, their their movies, really all of it. We're not, not huge fans to date, but, you know, shout out to Apple. They just keep swinging for the fences. Um, first new evidence of that is that Sundance Film Festival just happened and, or it might still be happening in some capacity, but... The big, like, showstopper movie was a film called Coda, um, which I believe is about a girl who has um, uh, family members with hearing impairments, and she's, like, trying to navigate and take care of them. It was a huge crowd pleaser at at Sundance, and Apple broke the Sundance acquisition record by paying $25 million to acquire this film, which broke a record that was set last year by Hulu when they acquired Palm Springs. Big, big deal. Really big deal right here. Um, I think I stated uh, previously, you and I watched kind of off the record, uh, The Sound of Metal, um, which is still on streaming on Prime right now if you have a subscription. Yes. And it's uh, anything with the deaf community, I've always had this just uh just this like magnetism to it's such a strong community uh that that's built that's so unique um it it is their own language and and the the people who are of the hearing disability world they they deserve to be seen and recognized and i don't know i've always just been struck with just this love for those group of people um and so this movie hearing that this this storyline's coming out Uh, Coda, exactly like you said, the girl is the only hearing member of her entire family. And so she's struggling with being the communicator for her family, for her family's business, uh, and also trying to grow up uh, in uh, as a, as a girl in looks like a rural, like fishing town almost uh, from just like the the shots of everything. So I'm so excited for this movie. Uh, uh, I, I can't wait to see it drop. Uh, it will definitely get at least one more month out of Apple TV Plus for me when it hits <laughs> their streaming system. If uh, if Apple doesn't just keep giving us free months of the subscription service, that is because like <laughs> like we talked about before, it's just like, hey, you could have this for free, and I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> I, I mean, sure, I'll, I'm not gonna like cancel this free subscription but i also don't care um maybe i will care after cherry maybe i will care after coda maybe one of these projects will grip me and say i need to be back i mean ted lasso i like ted lasso but do i like it enough to eventually pay for apple tv plus i think no so they need to start making it happen um so that's really exciting news and i think palm springs you know this is this story is very similar to Palm Springs in terms of like very different movies, but the same. It feels like deja vu from last year. It's like, oh, this movie Palm Springs starring Andy Samberg and Christina Milioti. Like, people are loving it. It's just killing audiences. It's so good. Hulu pays a boatload of money for it. They get it, and I think that movie is exactly as advertised. It was funny. It was a crowd pleaser. You can see why it was getting people excited at Sundance. It's just like a very easy to watch, enjoyable movie. Um, This movie, obviously subject matter is different, but I think we can expect a movie that is generally easy to watch and hopefully uplifting and and good. So I'm excited about it as well. Also on the Apple TV mm-hmm, Plus mm-hmm. side, they have ordered a limited series called We Crashed, all one word, um, starring Anne Hathaway and Jared Leto. 
It's a limited series, and it's based on the rise and fall of a company called WeWork, which was at one point valued at $47 billion and then collapsed like all the way down to a valuation of $5 billion. Their CEO got the boot and just crazy. So I'm, I'm like way into this. I don't know anything about WeWork, but I love stories of like greed, narcissism, egos. Like I love crap like that. So this one is exciting for me. Yeah, um, I'm gonna just um, take a nap during that because I can't. Uh, <laughs> I, I can't with Jared Leto. I can't. Oh no, it's... you're not even burying the lead. We got to talk about Jared Leto later, and I think uh, I'm scared now. I'm, I'm scared that this is going to become the Jared Leto bash fest, which I think actually started last week. I feel like last week we already started <laughs> trashing Jared Leto for some reason. I don't even know why. In the episode. On social, it's just going to be <laughs> 2021 is the year of Leto. Uh, oh boy, <laughs> to take him down. You oh, because we were talking about you know, more, we were talking about Morbius. Uh, uh, that's why. That's why we were talking about Jared Leto. Yes. Yeah, you know all um, all great celebrities have feuds, and I think this is ours. <laughs> so we're just going to feud with Leto all the time. Well, and Army Hammer, you're taking you're putting us against the world right now. You're pitting <laughs> us against. Army Hammer and Jared Leto, and we're like, what, 20 minutes into this episode? What's going to happen the rest of the time? Yeah, I'm just putting out the feelers. Like, whoever <laughs> actually gets mad at me throwing this out, we'll take that. We'll just cast the rest out like it never happened. That's I'm just trying to get some some friction and some traction going out here with this, Cam. That's all I'm doing. No, it's good. Friction is good. Um, this is interesting. This is This is timely. I'm listening to a book called um, originals by adam grant and he was talking he used uh, i had to bring this up because he used a film critic um, or like a literary critic as an example and i was like oh this is very interesting and what he said was they had a group of people read two different reviews of a like a literary work or a movie or something like that and one of the critics was super positive like very favorable toward the work. And the other one was like harshly negative towards it. And they rated people on average rated the critic who was negative as like 15% more intelligent than the critic who was positive because they feel like you have to like know the subject matter to be negative. So what I learned from that was be mean about movies and people and, and <laughs> cause some friction and people will think you're smart. That's what I took away. I don't think that was the exact message, but that's what I got out of it. Okay, gotcha. So be a jerk. Yeah. <laughs> people might think you're smart. So okay. you might be onto something. You're like taking taking aim at Army Hammer, taking aim at Jared Leto. You're like, listen, this is going to make me appear more intelligent. This is going to make me a better critic. And you know what? I'm I will observe and see how it goes for you. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. And uh, ride ride my coattails if it succeeds. Exactly. And uh, pu- push me into the ground and into the <laughs> dust if it fails. Yeah. See, I'm keeping my options open. I can I can <laughs> quickly distance myself from you, or I can you can take us to the moon. So it's it's really a win win for me. <laughs> yeah, and I will d- deny everything. I'll deny everything if it goes bad. I'll d- <laughs> we'll delete all of the footage. We will. We can we can do that. I will help you do that. All right. Um, some more news. We're moving away from Apple TV Plus acquisition stuff. This is one I was not expecting. And when I heard about it, I was like more excited than I thought I would be. Cloverfield is getting a sequel. Cloverfield, which is the monster, like the, it's like, I would call it a horror movie, but it's really not that scary. It's more of like a thriller, like Godzilla type of movie about a, like a world ending monster event type of thing. And the whole movie is shot in a found footage format, which is basically like the idea being somebody found like somebody's camcorder and watched the footage back of all this stuff that went down. So Cloverfield came out in 2008. Then they had 10 Cloverfield Lane, which was a horror movie uh, starring John Goodman, which was like a very different feel from Cloverfield and wasn't really a sequel to Cloverfield because it was happening at the same time. But now we are getting a true sequel to Cloverfield. Kirk, what are your thoughts mm-hmm. on Cloverfield 2, as I'm calling it for right now? 
Mm, yeah, I um, I unfortunately have no thoughts on this. That's rare. <laughs> I. <laughs> so you've not seen the original I, Cloverfield. I have not seen the original. Um, at, there was no aversion to it. I just have not gotten around to it. In um, let's see, carry the carry the one. It's been um, thirteen years. I've yeah. never seen it. Yeah, it's um. So you're like me. I mean, we're both scaredy cats. I think we've talked about that quite a bit. Like, I don't do scary movies at all. And so when I tell you that this movie is not, like, if that is your version, if you're like, I've always thought it would be too scary, let me just tell you, it's not. I don't see it as, like, a very scary movie, personally. Um, But, yeah, I mean, I think it's not, like, some sort of masterpiece, but I think it is a really fun movie. And it's one of those movies that I first remember hearing about J.J. Abrams and Bad Robot. Like, this, these are the first times, like, whenever I think back to the early days of learning about J.J., it's like I remember Lost and I remember Cloverfield. So I'm excited about mm. this. And let us not forget Felicity and Alias, all J.J. Right? Abrams properties. Yeah, which I was not on the Alias train. And I've heard that show is awesome, um, but I've not, I've not it's watched good. it. Now streaming the entire series on Amazon Prime. Oh, is it? That's nice. Yes. It it used to be on Netflix. I binged it all on Netflix before it went off that probably three years ago. And now it's all on Prime. Nice. So going to binge it again. Had you seen it before you binged it? Or did you pick, were you a late adopter? Great question. My parents watched most of it. I don't know if they watched it start to finish, but they watched a majority of it. And so I would always walk in the room and Jennifer Garner would be kicking someone's butt. And then I'd be like, oh, cool. And then I'd go watch like Good Burger for like the 13th time. Yes. So uh, it was like in, in my world. <laughs> so I was like, I'll watch this and absolutely loved it. It was It's fantastic. Awesome. I'll have to check that one out. So homework for you, watch Cloverfield. Homework for me, watch all of Alias. And I think I got screwed there, to be honest. Because <laughs> I have to watch, <laughs> I now just sign myself up to watch a whole television series. So that's not cool. Yes. And like old TV, not old TV, <laughs> but you know, TV when there's 22 episodes per season and there are, I bro, think, eight I know. Seasons. It's like, it's a grind because I'm I like have been going back and rewatching old HBO shows and like hitting some HBO shows that I that I hadn't seen before, um, and so I'm watching The Sopranos back because I never like I know how it ends and I watched here and there but I didn't like I I, I wouldn't describe myself as somebody who's seen every episode and man I'm like this is old TV <laughs> like it. You, when you think of The Sopranos, you don't think of it as an old show. But when you go back and watch it, it's like, man, there's so many episodes. Every episode is so long. It's like, it just feels way different. So it's it's it a is. grind. It's a grind. It is a great series. And one of the, one, one of the reasons, uh, you know, networks outside of the big players that's what that's because of the Sopranos that they got entered into the Emmys and the Golden Globes because You're of the right. Sopranos because it was so good. People said, "No, listen, listen, this stuff is good. They deserve to be uh, to be give to be awarded for it." And they broke in, and that was a big catalyst right there. Yeah, and I I, I think a lot of people credit the Sopranos for changing TV forever, just in in terms of yeah. people rethinking what television is because i think i think sopranos was just like some of that stuff you never saw in that medium ever like the like the violence the content like you just never really saw it and for them to take on that kind of storytelling it was really inventive so it's cool to revisit it and be like wow this must have been like at the time just like crazy mind-blowing awesome um i also remember what my parents watching that and i would wander into the (laughs) family room uh, to get a snack, and I'd kind of linger, and they'd be like, "Get out, get out, get out!" <laughs> like, get out! Somebody's getting his kneecap getting bashed in with like a lead pipe. You got to get out of here. Yes, and they couldn't pause it, and they couldn't uh, watch a rerun of it, uh, so they had to scream at me so they could watch <laughs> their content. <laughs> yeah, there's no pausing. That was, those were the dark ages, man. Those were what a horrible time. Uh, it sends shivers down my spine just thinking about it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Next bit of movie news, and this is changing. This is like a big change of pace from Cloverfield. But 
at long last, Kirk, a wicked movie is on the way from director John M. Chu, who is becoming like the de facto musical director these days because he's he's directing Lin-Manuel Miranda's In the Heights and now has been tapped to direct Wicked. Mm, that's good stuff. That's good stuff because you know, you know, we hear about people people kind of late uh when you're not like in the in the official biz yeah because their stuff is happening stuff's getting filmed and people are being trusted so the fact that we're we're getting that news out now it's only good news because if you can be trusted within with lin manuel's property you can be trusted with anything so this is exciting yeah it is exciting am i the only one who feels like we've been hearing about a wicked movie since wicked hit like hit broadway off and on for like Mm -hmm like what almost 20 years now it feels like like i don't know it feels like we've been hearing about a wicked movie forever and so i when i saw that this was announced i was like oh for real like we're actually going to do that because like this is you know you could have done it when it was like at its peak but sure yeah i'll take it (laughs) yeah when you told me i was when you (laughs) you told me the the show notes uh without spoilers and i'm like no cam this is real like we've known about this you're like no 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 not official (laughs) yeah not official (laughs) we've been talking about it for a thousand years but not official oh man but i'm excited i think wicked wicked is a great show it's a show that i see every time it comes to st louis like we just we always go it's just it's uh i don't know it's it's one of the first musicals that i can remember like really kind of obsessing over the soundtrack and the storyline. Just it's one of the first, in fact, like Hamilton feels like super modern musical and wicked doesn't anymore. But at the time wicked felt so different. It felt so cutting edge and modern. And so it was, it's almost like, like nothing can compare with what Hamilton has done to the musical scene and to theater. But Wicked was a trailblazer in its own right too. It was. I mean, that was one of that was a that was an album that people could not get to the theater <laughs> because tickets were impossible to see. Yes. Um, and there were you know there wasn't really social media at the time. The internet was probably only like eight years old. Uh, so the fact that it went viral, that's kind of a. a a success of its own yeah. that, that can never happen again. So, uh, yeah, wonderful show. It still has uh, some some fantastic tricks up its sleeve. And every time I see it, they kind of reinvent it. Every time it rolls out with a new team, a new company, it's like, wait, I've never seen that before. This is the eighth time I've seen it. What's <laughs> going on here? You know. So it's good on them for doing that. Yeah, and it makes you wonder, um, you know, as the story has evolved, what does that mean for the movie? You know, and like how they will interpret those characters and things like that. That's that's what gets me excited. And of course, like anytime there's a musical announced, the thing I get excited about is casting news. So today we're getting announced the director and that it's in the works. And in the coming months, I know we'll be getting casting news and I am chomping at the bit to get my hands on who that's going to be. Like, who are they going to cast as Elphaba? Is it going to be an unknown person? Is it going to be somebody that we know? I don't know. I'm, I'm excited. It's going to be good. Can't wait. Okay. Now I said, some stuff wouldn't be superheroes, but of course, as always, this is 2021 and superheroes are half of what's going on in mainstream media right now. So let's start on the DC comic side. Um, we have some news about the long awaited Snyder cut. It has been given an official release date of March 18th, 2021. It's going to be exclusively on HBO max as we knew. And there were some rumors about formatting of this. Would it be four hour long? Like, would it be a mini series or would it be a film? But we're, it's been confirmed that it will be a feature length film and that it will be in the range of four hours long. How are you feeling about this, the Snyder Cut, Kirk? <laughs> you know, there are, there are a few movies that I will tolerate for for that long very few oh i know there are right. few there are a few movies ever made that are actually that length on on purpose um this one i will not tolerate i will watch it but i will not tolerate it <laughs> so well i mean I there's just no way it. there's no way i'm watching this in one sitting it's just not possible i 
I, as, as they continue to give us more and more things at our fingertips, my attention span is getting so short. And I think, and I think that you might agree with me on this, that the first Justice League movie is a dumpster fire of biblical proportions. And I just do not believe that anything could be done with that to make it better and worth watching for four hours personally. I agree with every word you said, every word. Um, and I applaud you for the, the imagery <laughs> you provided our listeners. Yeah, I had to go there. Um, and so Zack <laughs> Snyder's been like, and listen, I don't know where you stand on Zack Snyder. I know we've had discussions about it. I think we're, we're in different points. I think Zack Snyder's a good filmmaker. I think he's made some good films. I think he's made some stinkers, big time. But... I totally understand the situation with what happened with him leaving the Justice League and why he had to leave the Justice League and all of that. Like, makes sense. Makes sense to me that he would want to finish this project and do it the way that he wanted it. Like, that all is crystal clear, and I'm totally here for that. But making it four hours, like, adding all this stuff, teasing it out, you know, announcing it a year ago, like this whole song and dance that we're going through for this, it feels like a bad idea. It feels like a bad idea for his career. It feels like a bad idea for Warner and specifically DC. Like I do not see this ending well personally. No, 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 it won't. Um, there should be there should be a viral challenge to uh, watch the Snyder Cut in one sitting. Uh, we should make whatever hashtag <laughs> that is a uh, trend. Uh, I don't think that this has any legs to stand on. Uh, someone put out the 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 notion that what if it's what if this makes the Justice League look like ten times better uh, on social? And I love that because what if what if it's like oh oh, I see from this terrible take how much better that one is and where they went with it. So I don't know if that's, I don't know what's going to happen, but. <laughs> oh, like this one is so bad. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> that, it, yeah. You know, like when you watch like a, when you watch a deleted scene that you're like, oh, that should have been in the movie. Yeah. Most of the time it shouldn't have, it should not have been. But there are times when you're like, that would have been super helpful to understand X, Y, Z in this movie. What if that's what we get and then Justice League just by proxy is just like now then a phenomenal film. Uh, I love the idea of that. So we'll we'll see. We'll see. Um, March 18th, I'm marking my calendar because I don't know if I can carve out half of, of a work day to <laughs> watch this movie. Man. I'll but tell I'll try you. to watch as much as possible because if I have to watch this in like eight sittings, well, then that's just unfair. That's just unfair. Yeah, it's going to be a toughie. It's going to be a toughie. And um, here, here's the thing I always do too. I get frustrated with the, and I might get, I might get clobbered for this, but I'm going to put it out there. These do fans, it. these fans who are like the Lord of the Rings extended cuts are the only way to watch the Lord of the Rings. I'm like, listen, I love the Lord of the Rings with all of my heart or the vast majority of it. I love it so hard. And I've watched the extended versions and I've watched the original version, the theatrical cuts umpteen times, countless times. But here is the thing. The medium is feature film and that has a time limit. So I don't want to hear that the extended cuts of anything are better movies because that's just false by inception. It can't be a better movie if it's four hours long because the key to making a great feature film is being concise and and packing it into something that can be digested in one sitting. And I think that that's already where this one has a black mark in my book, personally. Mm-hmm. I keep saying well personally because I'm I'm scared. <laughs> I'm scared of the I'm scared of the Snyder Cut fans and their their fandom. I'm scared they're going to come after me. But anywho, oh, they will. They, they will find us. They're relentless. I mean, these people created this. They did through social media. They created this. Think about that for a second. It's crazy times. Um, they did. They really did. 
They really did. Okay. Moving over to the other side of the superhero aisle and into the MCU. This story, man, caught me totally by surprise yesterday, but man, was I excited. We're getting a Wakanda series on Disney+. Plus. This was not previously announced. This was never teased. Nobody knew this was coming. This is, this is out of the blue. And it's being showrun by Ryan Coogler, who is, I mean, a genius. He's one of the biggest up-and-coming creators that we have. And he helmed Black Panther, the film. So this is a great fit. And Disney, I believe, uh, as part of this, has signed Ryan Coogler to some sort of exclusive deal that gives him the ability to create shows for things outside of Disney, you know, like maybe FX and stuff like that. And he's got lots of pull. So this is, uh, this has got me pretty giddy. I'm excited about this. Super exciting. If there's ever a world that we could definitely explore more of it's, it's Wakanda. Uh, it's, it's the perfect, uh, addition to MCU's growing universe. And yes. How cool will it, will it be to see it intertwine with everything going on? Uh, it's just it's just the perfect move. I don't know why I didn't see it or even think that it was a possibility, but super glad that it is because that's it's going to be really really fun. It's going to be fun. I think it's got potential for multiple seasons too. I mean, they yeah. could introduce new characters, start from the ground up. Um, like you said, I mean, I think the world of Wakanda is just the coolest thing, and and Ryan Coogler did such a good job of bringing that to life in that first movie. I mean, that's what makes that first movie really sing is the concept of Wakanda, the way they executed it, the way that it's, you know, hidden in that dome and, you know, just everything about it is so slick and so cool and different. I mean, it just, it like is a totally, it's one of the truly unique ideas in the Marvel Cinematic Universe too, I think. It's just like, something you do not see anywhere else. And um, I'm stoked about the opportunity to explore it further. So that's going to be fun. Yeah. Yes. Last bit of news. We're talking WandaVision, which we actually do every single week if you guys have not caught it yet on our YouTube channel. Go on YouTube, search Popcorn for Breakfast. You can also find the link to it on our social pages. Kirk and I have been doing a little program called Spilled Popcorn. Yes, Spill the Popcorn, Kirk. Love it. <laughs> dump it out uh, where we do full blown episode recaps and analysis and we've been taking um, everybody through uh, WandaVision so far one episode at a time so we're all the way caught up if you're, if you're caught up on the show go to our YouTube page and check that out but even though WandaVision is almost at halfway through just about halfway through we got another... 44, 44%. 40, yes. 44% through. Thank you, Kirk. Thank you for the exact math <laughs> there. Um, we got another story today via Elizabeth Olsen who had an interview with TV Line who said she is, quote, very excited about... Uh, I'm unquoting now. So she just very excited was in quotes. <laughs> Everything else is paraphrasing. <laughs> She's very excited about a cameo... What if you forgot to do the end quote and you went I just the talked the, the rest of the episode. episode. <laughs> and someone listened to this and put that as her whole stupid... <laughs> her whole quote. It was like 40 minutes. She started talking about the little things. She started talking was... about actual little things. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, man. Oh, boy. Anywho. Well, um, what she said was she's very excited about a cameo that's upcoming or an appearance by someone and she equated it to Luke Skywalker appearing in the Mandalorian that level of reveal she's very Spoiler. excited um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry how did I not do that how did I not do that oh man I just ruined people's lives who haven't seen the full Mandalorian um, but anyway that's what she equated it to so my question to you Kirk is who's it going to be <clears throat> I cast my vote for Robert Downey Jr. as Tony Stark. Ooh, Robert Downey Jr. I I, I like that one. Actually, um, Jackie, my wife, said the exact same thing. She's like, oh, it's got to be Tony Stark, right? Um, I don't know. And here's why. The other thing we talked about on Spilled Popcorn was that Paul Bettany kind of teased this on a podcast that he was on recently. And he was like, 
I believe, if I remember correctly, he said something like, this is somebody I've wanted to work with for a long time, which, if that's true, takes Tony Stark off the table. Um, I've, been, I've been on our show, our, our web series, talking about Doctor Strange, Benedict Cumberbatch. That is not a Luke Skywalker level cameo, but would be super cool and would make a lot of sense based on where things are heading, but I, I don't know. Here's a question for you. We talked about it a little bit. Quicksilver reappearing. Would that yeah. would that be this level in your mind? Would that be that high of a level? No, no, not really, because we didn't get enough. We didn't get enough of him in the actual films that he was in. Um, yeah, so I feel nah. similarly in the sense that it's almost to me that's almost expected in a way. Like yeah. Pietro coming back wouldn't be super surprised. Like it would be cool and it'd be like, Oh wow, they did that. But it wouldn't be like jaw dropping. Wow. And I think to your point, you know, like Robert Downey Jr. Coming back, he's dead, you know, like he, he's dead. And they like in the end credits of Endgame had like a nice send off for him. And then they even addressed it in the Spider-Man far from home. Movie. Like he's dead, dead. Um, so that would be a big shock. I don't know who else, other than a new character, which would be, oh, dude, if they like, if they squirrel, squirrel, squirrel girl, squirrel girl, squirrel girl. <laughs> that would be terrible. <laughs> um, that would be so terrible. Dude, the internet is is just like there's this huge campaign to get Squirrel Girl into the MCU. I don't know how it would work, but there were really there it, have so. always been rumors and I think this is totally BS. I think somebody just created this and the internet latched onto it. There have always been rumors of this Anna Kendrick Squirrel Girl movie. And I'm like <laughs> Yes, that's right. I'm like what in the world? Why do we want this? Why like why? I don't understand. As a Marvel fan, I don't understand why we would want this. Um but if they were to introduce somebody like Power Man or um, Adam Warlock, you know, Adam Warlock's been teased. I, I don't know how he would fit into this whole mix, but if they were to introduce a new character, I think that would be bigger. Oh, dude, what if it's an X-Man? Can you imagine? That'd be pretty cool. That'd what be if it cool. What if it was like a new Wolverine, or like, you know, like or like a Professor X? That would be. Imagine they kept that under wraps this whole time. They went through Disney Investor Day and all these leaks about Spider Man Three and all this stuff. But the one thing they kept under wraps is that they're introducing a new X Men character in this. Sh- I don't know. That would be mind blowing. Dude, what if James McAvoy rolls up there <laughs> in his ball with his bald head? In his chair. I'm in favor wild. of that for, for the record. I'm in favor of that. Like I know there were rumors that they had asked Patrick Stewart to be involved in in general, like being Professor X still, and he was like, uh, I'm too old for that gig, you know, these days, which is fair. Um, but it seems like if that's true, then they clearly are like keeping the doors open on bringing in some of those legacy – x-men people and in that case james mcavoy could be a, a really cool play mm-hmm. i like the x-men play i like it uh either either way it has to be coming um soon it has to be coming soon because you know they film they film these things a long time ago these actors and they kind of probably forget like when does that happen so it's got to <laughs> be coming soon like they're watching it come out on on disney plus week by week themselves but they're like oh yeah was that episode five? Whoops. You know, so I think yeah. I think we might hit this next episode. We'll see. It's possible. Maybe now that people are starting to talk about it in interviews, it's because like they know that it's coming. So it'd be interesting. All right. Yep. That's it for what's pop, and let's pop it up one last time. All right. Let's move into our let's move into our movie review. I almost said let's movie into our movie review. Um, this week we're. Ooh, I rev- like that though. <laughs> it's a little, little cheesy, but that's okay. We we cheese it up sometimes on here too. Um, we're reviewing a movie called The Little Things, which is, am I synopsing, Kirk? I I already forgot. We just talked about this before the show, and I forgot. Mm, it is. It is you. It, it is, is me. You, it is me. It is me. Yeah, you're right. 
Um, okay, so synopsis of The Little Things. The Little Things is a crime thriller about two um, law enforcement officers, one who is like an up-and-coming star detective in the LAPD, played by Rami Malek, um, the other who is like a disgraced former detective of the LAPD who's now working in like some different county as basically like a sheriff's deputy. Um, that's played by Denzel Washington. Basically, Denzel Washington's character, um, Deke, uh, last name Deacons. What's his first name? Um, it is. John? I'll tell you. Keep talking. Yeah, so Deke comes into town to... Um, collects some evidence from LAPD. They're helping them out on some sort of case and ends up hearing about this string of um, serial murder cases involving young women. Um, and so he is like, being a former detective, we start to find out that he had some cases that are reminiscent of this. And so he starts to get involved. He like takes PTO off work and like meets with the detective. And before long, it's, Rami Malek and Denzel Washington's characters trying to solve this serial case by themselves. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail because it's it, it it can get spoilery. But um, Jared Leto's in there, obviously you know from the marketing materials, and he looks pretty creepy in the marketing materials. So you know, be that as it may, <laughs> you can probably connect some dots there. He ends up being a suspect. So. Um, yeah, that's basically it. The The whole story is basically them trying to solve this case and kind of how these two people who are so different, you know, the disgraced ex-cop or, or ex-detective and the up-and-coming detective kind of team together and are drawn to each other to try to solve these cases. So that's it. Anything I missed, Kirk? Uh, now streaming on HBO Max. That's right. It's streaming on HBO Max. You can see it in theaters if you want to. Um, if you feel comfortable with doing it, go support your local theater. I think it's a good thing to do. Um, sadly, I have not been out to the theater since they reopened last week, but I'm looking forward to the opportunity to do so because I want to help help our friends and our community members out. But I think it's it's a good thing to do if you um, have the time and the money and the, and you feel like you can do it safely. That's a good good thing to do. All right, let's review this movie and let's start off, as we always do, with And the Oscar Goes To. I'm kicking us off and this is, t- this is tough. So last week was tough because we had four really great performances by four gentlemen who did an incredible job in One Night in Miami. This week is tough for different reasons. Um... I'm giving mine to Rami Malek, who plays the up-and-coming police detective. And here's what I will say. I think he was miscast big time. Um, I, do not, I do not think that this role was a fit for him. Like, Rami Malek typically plays characters who are eccentric in nature. You know, Mr. Robot, Freddie Mercury. He's playing a villain in a James Bond movie. You know, he is an eccentric kind of guy plays that role really well. This was the opposite of that. He was like super straight laced by the book detective family man. It just was like very bizarre. That being said, I think in the back half of the film, he does a good job to make you care about what's going on in the front half of the film. I can't say he does much of that, but that is just because this movie really struggles to get going. The dialogue in the front half is tough. Um, and I don't blame him too much for that. And the fact that he was miscast and still ended up doing a pretty good job in the back half of the movie and making some, you know, making some emotional plays and having some good scenes, I think that's what did it for me. So I'm giving it to Rami Malek. Excellent choice. Uh, my Oscar goes to... Mr. Denzel Washington. Yeah. Yes. The king, the king stays king. Mr. <laughs> Two time Oscar winner, best actor, best supporting actor, training day, and glory in that order, but not in time. Mr. Mr. Denzel Washington, I, I just, 
every time I see him come on screen, man, you know what kind of charisma you're going to get. But you have to understand that every time he approaches a role, he approaches it with care. Um, obviously, every actor brings themselves to the role, but they study the the surroundings and the objectives of that character. And Denzel j- does just that. That that's why he's. Uh, I think he was just announced as the greatest actor of this. Uh, decade or century he just just got a big time big time award uh and he he deserves it he, he really does so uh kudos to him I, I love watching him i love seeing what little tricks he's gonna do because there there's definitely new stuff he's always learning and it's so cool because there are times in this in this film in particular uh we know that denzel is uh climbing an age i don't know his exact age but i'm gonna guess he's in his 60s by now where there are are moments where you see him and you're like, man, he looks just like he did when he was 20 and I, <laughs> when I was watching him in Ricochet, you know? <laughs> and it's like, it's like so cool to see that just that energy he brings to to a role. Uh, so got to be Denzel. The king stays king. Love it. Yeah, you got to love Denzel. That's why he's my scene stealer. Um I will disagree with you in some ways about his performance in this movie. So the reason that I made him scene stealer rather than the Oscar is that I felt like in some scenes he was he was a true scene stealer. Like went for it, did a good job, and you're like, oh, I felt something. I, like I feel like invested, you know? And, and it's because of you, Mr. Denzel, and thank you for doing that. And in other scenes, I was like, man, does he even want to be here? Like... <laughs> <laughs> blase and, and, and he is a little bit of like a nonchalant guy it's part of his essence but there were times where i was like the body language the the delivery i was like man he either really hates the lines that he's reading or he's like did not sleep well last night i don't know there were just times where like he was very nonchalant and i was like man come on you you can add so much to a movie if you just give it your all the whole time, and I didn't feel like we got Denzel's all the whole time, but when we did, he was a difference maker. So he's my scene stealer. Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, that's funny. This is one of the first movies that we're going to have completely different uh, <laughs> Oscar goes to and scene stealers. We have completely different ones. Sometimes, usually there's some overlap, so this is exciting. Cameron, I'm going to give my scene stealer to Mr. Jared Leto. Okay, there we go. Let's let's throw up a point for Leto after you were waging war against him earlier. Yeah, yeah. I'm but but bear with me though. I'm giving it to him for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> oh no. Oh no. <laughs> because our definition of scene stealer is you can't take the, your eyes off of them. You mm-hmm. gravitate to them. Uh, they're captivating. Well, there can be different <laughs> versions of captivating Cam, dude. When he is on screen in this, he is trying so hard yes. to act. So hard. There's the famous line uh, Lawrence Olivier said, have you tried acting? Uh, as we know, Jared Leto is, and that's exactly how Lawrence Olivier sounded, <laughs> acting. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty good. Thank you. Uh, we know that uh, Jared Leto is a, is a kind of a creep uh, freak <laughs> method actor, and has sent like gross things to his co-stars on the sets of anything that he's been on. Uh, so when he comes on the screen and he steals the scene, it's for all the wrong reasons. He is upstaging every other actor trying to throw his weight around in front of stinking Denzel Washington. <laughs> like, bro, stop. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. I, I just got kind of annoyed with him because th- there's, there's parts of him that... Uh, that you you can see how much effort he's putting in, but he's missing the mark. It, it, it's just it's it, if he just had someone who loved him, like truly loved him, and just said, <laughs> "Jared, Jared, you're almost there, but don't do what you're doing right now." That is why he is my scene stealer again, with caveat asterisk for the all the wrong reasons. Well, you got me there, Kirk. I was uh, I was I fell for it. I, I thought you were gonna. <laughs> I thought you were gonna give him a real. Act. Albeit, I was surprised because of all the things that you said. I was surprised that you were gonna go that route, but I was. Uh, you got me. So, congrats to you. Let me just read you a tweet that I read that made me nearly pee my pants. Um, I won't admit if I actually peed my pants, but let's just say it was close. This is <laughs> this is on Twitter from at HPJ Art. 
tweet says, Jared Leto be killing people in real life to get ready for roles just to get 20% on Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just so true, man. Like, he's he's a method actor, but, like, one of those that just cannot back it up with performances. I'm like, dude, most people who are method actors, you're like, okay, they're clinically insane, but did you see them in my left foot? Like, yes. <laughs> amazing, yes. you know? Like, it's stuff like that, not, oh, he's a method actor, he's totally nuts, and also sucks. Like, that's, it's just so frustrating. <laughs> um, and I know that he's won an Oscar, and I don't want to get into all that. That, you know, that is what it is. Sometimes these things happen. <laughs> And I'm so gonna, I will say and we'll we'll keep it short, but Jared Leto won an Oscar in a time just a few years shy where he would have been not even considered up for an Oscar nomination. Probably uh, true. Hashtag representation. He, it just he just wouldn't have. So, yeah, uh, I don't know. Uh, I, maybe they'll revoke it from him with with good regard because he is. Well, let's move on. <laughs> yeah. And for a role that wasn't particularly difficult. Um, I'll just say that too. Um, so it's this guy, you know, he, he gets to be an Academy Award winner for the rest of his life. This performance surely showed that he won't be winning another one anytime soon. Um, why, what was going on with this character design also? Like why the way that he walked, what was with the way that he walked? His physical body language was so bizarre. It was so you know, strange. So uh, I've I've spent many years as an actor, and I, one of the things that I love the most uh, when I'm on stage is to figure out the movement of a character. Mm -hmm. The movement of a character, and I've talked about it on this podcast before too, it is key because you could just walk around like your normal self, but when you can fully embody another person, uh, it really shifts someone's idea of what they're watching because – they kind of have an idea. You kind of have an idea of how a celebrity moves through a space. Like when they're on a talk show, they're like, oh, that's that's uh, Will Smith's strut. Look at him go. He's <laughs> he's such a cool guy, right? Um, but then when, when all of a sudden he's walking completely different, either he's insecure or he's a hustler, you know, he's trying like in pursuit of happiness or whatever it might be. That's what Jared Leto was trying to do. Man. Uh, and I imagine that he probably like watched people for a long time to try to nail down how he would move in this role. And it just, it didn't fly with me. And obviously it didn't fly with you. Either. It was so bad. It was, it's one of those things that you shouldn't notice. And if you're noticing it, it's bad. It's really, yeah. it's really bad. And also he, they like made him, have somewhat of a belly in this movie. I don't think he actually gained weight. It looks like when they make a skinny kid fat in like an eighth grade musical, like it looked like someone had legit taken dryer sheets and like stuffed it towards the bottom. And like they started to fall down like farther and farther as the movie went. And so then it just looked like he had like a life preserver around his, like it looked right. so bad. I was floored by that. So then in that case, you have Jared Leto, who argu arguably weighs 115 pounds. Yeah, it has that. like a lumpy <laughs> stomach. That Like what? <laughs> it was so weird. <laughs> it was I could not stop laughing. Every time he came on the screen, I was like, what is happening? Um, <laughs> wow. Well, anyway, that was Scene Stealer. Let's, let's move forward. Uh, <laughs> showstopper. Here's my showstopper. This is a different one. I've never done this one before, especially not in a movie like this. Going with the cars. Oh, nice. I love cars and movies. I think if I was a director of movies, I would spend the majority of my time picking out the vehicles that people get to drive. And I, so this movie was set in 1990. I, I love cars. I'm not like a car fanatic. I can't look at a car and tell you exactly what year it came from. These cars didn't look like 1990. They looked like they would have been old cars in 1990. But I just loved every single one of them. I loved um, Deke's little, like, whatever it was, like, rodeo or old-school Jeep Wrangler or whatever he had going on there. Yeah. I liked that. I liked um, Jared Leto's character had multiple cars that looked better than they should have looked, but I really enjoyed them. And uh, I just dug that vibe. So that's what I, that's what I keyed in on. I was going to say production design. Because there are some good parts of like 1990s LA that they really hit home on, but there are other parts that I'm like, eh, that feels like, especially when they're in the um, 
like police headquarters, that felt way too modern to me. That felt like that could have been today in a, yeah. in a lot of ways. So I was like, it's not consistent, but I would say in general, the cars were consistent and were really good. Yeah, good point. <clears throat> it took me a long time to figure out what era they were in until they kept using pay phones. And I'm like, oh, oh, this is not current. <laughs> so we're all. pre self. I know it was not super clear, but I think they scroll it at the very beginning of the movie as if this matters. <laughs> <laughs> they throw at the they throw at the bottom October 1990 if I remember correctly and that's the only reference to timing that we get really. I was just a wee chap. I wasn't even one in October <laughs> of 1990. Yeah, it's all a blur. My showstopper. Are you going to be mean again, Kirk? <laughs> <laughs> you know, take it as you will. My showstopper is also Jared Leto. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> once again oh no for all oh, the no. wrong reasons typically the showstopper in our in past episodes we talk about how marvelous they are you know one, one of recent note was when we get to wonder woman 84 when they're in the jet and there's fireworks and they're they're like oh we love each other yeah no no this showstopper means it literally stopped the show every time it put everything on pause and i was just <laughs> Wanted to move forward with the plot and the idea of, of whatever was happening in the story. Jared Leto, you stopped the show, and therefore you get the first showstopper uh, dis award, anti award. We've got to figure out a name for that. Yeah. I have to say, <laughs> we, I said we didn't talk about this movie, but we did talk briefly about one scene over the weekend, which was the very first scene that Jared Leto <laughs> appears. <laughs> And he doesn't even speak a word and he's only on screen for one second, but he like peeks out from the back of a break room and it is the worst acting I've ever seen out of someone who was on screen for maybe two seconds and didn't say a word like flat out. It's the worst. It's like the worst thing I've ever seen. Yeah. It it felt like it should have come out of like, um, like a, like a scene from Mac and me, like a, like an FBI or like the room. Uh, or, or the room, yes, excellent, excellent. Uh, yeah, it was it was rough. It, it was very. And rough. it's all it's all downhill from there, man. I mean, it's just it gets bad. <laughs> um, okay, let's move on to the other side. As you've probably picked up on, we have some notes and critiques for this movie. Um, sounds like on both ends. My director's shoes. I've got a lot of things going on here, but here's what I will say. There's two big things. One, pacing in this movie is a mess. It's a mess. They cannot get it right. Anytime they build momentum, they instantly kill it with a weird scene that doesn't make sense and goes on for far too long. The beginning of the movie, they struggle to build momentum by having this overly convoluted set of serial murder cases that they do an inadequate job of explaining. So you you don't even feel like you're really in on it like you it's it's not like when you're watching seven and and you know every case what happened what's significant about it etc they make it like really concise you know detailed but not um not just like impossible to follow in this movie they did that which took wind out of their sails and then in the in the late game when they start to get momentum built up They either extend the scenes too long or they cut a scene too short and throw in a different scene that doesn't really make much sense right after it. So the pacing is a mess. And then without spoiling, the other big thing is that they spend, I think this movie's, you know, just a shade over two hours. Um, They spend the vast majority of that time building up this thesis of, we're in the crime thriller drama. Here's what we're trying to solve. Here's what's going to happen. You know, you're building towards this certain resolution and then they undermine that entire thesis in the last 10 minutes of the movie, which leaves you with like, okay, you could have gotten to that point and ended a movie there. That's, that's fine if that's what you want to tell us. But now you just made it to where the whole rest of the movie didn't matter. And I wonder why I even watched it um, because all of like so many of these things were irrelevant and not important. And you spent so much time on them 
Um, and now that's all out the window. So you're just ticked off because you're like, I just watched a two hour movie that where everything I thought that was going to be important ended up not being. So that's my director's shoes. And I've got more, but I'm going to leave it there. Red herring, red herring, red herring, red herring. Uh, yeah, this, the foundation of this film holds no water um, because you don't know where it's going. So if you've ever watched a movie, it's so important for uh, the cinemat- cinematographer to tell the story uh, left to right. So think about it when you're reading a book, you read, uh, in, if you're American and you're reading English, uh, you're reading left to right. I think I need to go the opposite way with my hand for the camera. <laughs> yes. So you're reading left to right. You're reading left to right, whichever way you're sitting. And so when we watch a cam, when we watch a character watch uh, walk across the screen or run left to right, it's typically left to right because that's the forward projection of the film. Yep. Now, in mind bending movies or time time traveling movies, you'll see that it's all over the place, but it should be carefully thought out. In the beginning of this movie, we have uh, Denzel walking in the wrong direction from one scene to the next where he's walking into the police station, but then into his house, but then at a crime scene, you're like, where are we? <laughs> what happened? They're all There's all different angles that he's crossing, and you don't know where you're at. Like I said, I didn't know we were in the 90s until I saw multiple payphone calls, and then I was like, oh, all right, I kind of get it because I missed uh, the, the, the Chiron text at the beginning there. Um, so the non, it's a very linear story and the beginning of it is told in a non or expressed at least in a non-linear way that's hyper specific and maybe not everyone would feel that way, but I feel like generally you can feel a sense of, I don't know what's going on at the beginning of this film. The second one I want to, the second thing I want to bring up is this movie had a huge opportunity for a huge redeeming twist. Yes. And I can't even tell you what it is. Uh, I'll tell Cam offline. Maybe we'll spoil it on social later this <laughs> week with like a special spilled popcorn like mini episode. I don't know. But it had a huge opportunity to have an incredible twist that would have redeemed everything they set up, all the things that all the things that they laid out foundationally that Cam was talking about and then just didn't follow up on them. Uh but then they just didn't do it, and it just confused me overall. So I have, I would love to get in the room with the director and uh, get his cut. Uh, what, what's the director's name? Uh, so instead of the Snyder cut, we're going to get the John uh, Lee Hancock, something like that. The Hancock cut or the Lee Hancock cut. So that's what I want out of out of this uh, from this episode. I demand, and I will start the petition because I think we could make this movie good. It's possible. Yeah, I think it's definitely possible. Yeah, John Lee Hancock um, is the director. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think here's the thing is like pulling off, like setting people up for something and then giving them something else is totally fair game and, yes. and should be. But you have to <laughs> you have to do so in the way to, so a lot of times people will use genre to do this. They'll, they'll lull people to sleep with we're in this genre you know, set the stage for that. All the genre tropes, all the themes, all the things people are used to seeing gets them in a sense where maybe without even knowing it, they're like, okay, here's what's going to happen. But what you do is when you do a different reveal or something that's totally off the wall, totally off the beaten path, all that stuff that happened in the beginning still has to make sense for how it ended. It still has to, they still have to arrive at the same point. That's what can make something really great. You know, like, Movies like Chinatown and movies like Seven, Seven, I've mentioned Seven already, but basically they're leading you down one path and you're like, oh man, here's where we're going. And then they give you something else, but then whenever you walk it back, you're like, wow, well done. I, you tricked me. I, I thought we were going down this path and we didn't, but guess what? It still makes sense. In this case, you get all of that, but you don't get the, it still makes sense because it, it doesn't. So um, yeah, good call. It's it, it could have been a good movie, Kirk, to, to your point. I think it it has lots of issues. I'll, I'll just go right into my overall thoughts on the movie and my score since we're kind of there. But, like, this movie had potential. It had good actors. It, if it was... If they had expressed more discipline in the writing and the directing of the movie, it really could have been something pretty interesting. We... I don't feel like we've had a really good crime thriller recently... Um, which is a bummer because it's a it's just a great genre and and one that I love deeply, and so 
I was bummed out that we didn't really get that with this movie. And I, I, I really gave it a fair shot. And every time I, I found myself going down, going to this place of like, man, I'm really not enjoying this. I'm not buying in. I would, I would blame it on like, well, you're not paying as much attention as you should be, or you're getting distracted or whatever. And at the end of the day, that, that just, it's just because it wasn't well executed. So I'm giving it uh, a 3.0 out of 10. Um, it had some moments towards the end where it started to get interesting. And actually my wife even walked into the room and she was like, is this a good movie? It, it like, it seems like something I might like. And I was like, well, it hasn't been good up until now. <laughs> it's starting to get kind of good. But <laughs> and so, uh, but then in the end it, it kind of all falls apart yet again. So I'm giving it a 3.0 because it, it had a glimmer there for a second, but it, it ended up uh, kind of getting blown out there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, there's there's not much more to say than that. I think we we've picked it apart, um, and I really would love I really would love to ch- to chat with Mister Mister John Lee Hancock because the cinematography of this film is pretty stellar. Um, he yeah, it looks good. Had all the ingredients of of a great of a great film. I recently was listening to a podcast. It was either Conan O'Brien needs a friend or Mr. Rob Lowe's literally and one of their guests, can't remember who, said, you know, you can have all of the best actors <clears throat> and I it's, so this is great citation for whoever the random guest was on their latest episode. Um <clears throat> it was either Kevin Nealon on Rob Lowe's literally or whoever was on Conan's podcast. Uh oh, Brian Cranston. So if you can either ha- you can have the best cast ever, but if the writing is not correct, they can only bring it up a grade above what the writing is. They can't get it to the A level. Yeah, that's um, the gangster squad effect. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Great cast, horrible movie, terribly written, poorly executed. Perfect case study, that film right there. <laughs> so that's that's where this film lies. The the writing had an opportunity. There's there's holes in the in the script of this story that the director and the whole creative team should have figured out before it hit the editing floor um, or on the editing floor, correct it, and it just didn't happen. So it's a frustrating thing. I will raise you a point to one. I'll give it three point one. Hey, only because, there it is. Only because the cinematography really was quite stellar. And once I figured out what era we were in, <laughs> I loved the use of that of that time frame of, of how they used, you know, their um their resources of, of what would have happened you know, with, with communication and tricks that you could, you can't do now that you had to figure it out and think on your feet then. So that's why it gets literally point one more than your score. Love it. Good stuff. Um, yeah, check out the little things. It's, it's interesting. Um, I'll be interested to see what people say, uh, because after I wrote out my score and, and shortly after I saw that tweet about the 20% on Rotten Tomatoes, I went to see kind of like, what the fan score was on Rotten Tomatoes, and it was higher than I was expecting, like, by by quite a bit. I think it was, like, I don't want to misquote it, but it was it was fresh. It was not, fans did not hate it, at wow. least whenever well, I checked bravo. it earlier today. So so that's, maybe, uh, that's worth noting. Maybe we're, maybe we're wrong, Cam. Maybe we're wrong. Yeah, I mean, we're wrong fairly. I mean, we can be wrong. <laughs> so, I mean... It, it seems like it could be one of those movies where critics kind of do not like it, but other people do, and, you know, critics aren't always right. Um, we're not always right. So it'll be, it, or, you know, it's all object, all subjective. So let us know what you think, and if you have a different read into this movie and kind of how it goes. So check that out. You can Again, you can find it on HBO Max. You can also watch it in your local movie theater if they are open. Um, be sure to give those guys a shout because they would much, much appreciate your business, I'm sure. All right, let's get weird a little bit. We're doing a schoolyard pick. This is a funny one. We're doing a schoolyard pick of little things based on our movie, (laughs) The Little Things. Um, What did we decide this was? Like actual little things? Is that what we're talking about? No, it's both. It's both actual little things and figurative little things. Yeah, figurative little things, like the little things that you really enjoy. Is that what we're talking about? Yeah, so anything little. 
It can be an actual small thing or it can be something that is like small but makes you really happy inside, like a small little thing that happens. Um, love it. All right, Kirk, since I synopsed, you are first at the plate for schoolyard pick. What's your number one overall pick going to? Dude, my number one pick is sometimes my wife will go to the grocery store or to the gas station or Walgreens, tar- wherever. She'll go to a store and she will come back with one little candy treat for me. And uh, <laughs> it's fantastic. I never ask her to do it. Uh, in fact, I uh, more and more these days, I try to keep more candy out of our house because when you have little kids, people just give you candy all the they time. They do, it's true. <laughs> and so I love candy, but if it's in my house, I will eat all of it. So um, she knows she knows that that uh, I need my my take five Reese's or um, whatever it might be that I'm currently craving, and she'll just just like slide it across the uh, the table to me, and she's like, "Got that for you." I love it. it. It just makes my day. Love it. That's a good one. That's a good one. That is both a little thing and a little thing, figuratively <laughs> and literally. I like it. Well done. Um, my first pick is easy, and I I apologize if this is too broad. So if if you want to get out the rule book that's that's fine but i'm going with babies and i'm talking all babies little human babies puppies kittens Mm -hmm. bear cubs um anything that's a baby it's just grown grown men who act like babies was is this part of your category uh, no just (laughs) be not not people who are like cry babies i don't like that but anything that is just like a miniaturized version of a big thing it like just so cute Baby anything is adorable. It's just a fact. Except for like maybe baby Tasmanian devils. I think they come out like all like sticky and they don't have any hair and, and they're like crazy. Um, maybe that, maybe not that, but like everything as a baby is absolutely adorable. Baby giraffe, baby rhino. Like it's just, it's, it's adorable. And so I got to go with it. Got to go with babies. That's beautiful. That's a beautiful thing. Um, I'm going to get, you said, let's get weird. So I'm going to get real weird with this one. Yes. Um, hopefully there are more people out there who do this. Um, I'm <laughs> sure. It's, We're about to find out either that or you're about to put yourself on front street. <laughs> I know you're going to blast me as soon as it leaves my lips. Um, <laughs> so I wish I had a, a, a remote control with me, but you know, like how some buttons, this is an actual little thing, how some buttons on remote controls are really quite tiny they're circular i love to press them i love the way the rubber feels against my thumb and i will i will literally take the batteries out of a remote control if it feels like like a cool enough thing and i'll just like sit there and press press the button you know just like i i, I like um thing, <laughs> things like <laughs> i like the feeling uh, of like getting my finger my fingernails in there and kind of like digging into my cuticles just slightly with uh-huh with the button itself and uh that's uh i hope that's not on like dr phil's list of uh serial killer attributes but that's that's my little thing wow um well thank you for sharing this is a safe space i think i'm gonna try to try to keep it a safe space i have to say i I do not share that one with you um let's hope for your sake that other people do (laughs) otherwise you just uh you know added yourself as a massive weirdo doing weird things <laughs> with your fingernails and the buttons on the remote control. I don't know. I don't know. I, I mean, I don't know. Oh, man. We used to have a remote control where you could take the front off of it um, and oh. pop the keypad out. Um, and, like, you remember, like, those old Nokia cases where you could, like, take the keyboard out and it was rubbery? So yes. if, if that's similar, like, I, I feel you there, but I have not done it with the actual TV remote. You know what? I'm going to come to your house uh, this week. I'll show you show me, on yeah. your remote. <laughs> yeah, that'd be good. Maybe I, maybe I'm just missing out. Maybe this is something that I need in my life to help give me a sense of comfort, to give me a sense of self. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm not opposed to it, but I, I have to admit it's uh, <laughs> it was not what I was expecting. <laughs> it's the weirdest thing on my list. So Love it. Okay. So that's your number two. Good one. Um <laughs> For my number two, I mean, I'm worried. I'm worried. I'm going to end up with a bunch of like food <laughs> things. Um, I'm going to go with mini powdered donuts, and more specifically, donuts. You're familiar with mm. donuts? Um, mm-hmm. They come in like the little, the little like 
lunch sack thing. You like unroll the top and oh my gosh, it is unreal how good those things taste. I don't even, it doesn't even make sense to me because like they're not fresh. They're, they're like made, they're made in a factory. They're processed, you know, it's just, yeah, they're like 10 years old for sure, it is but just they're so good. Unreasonable how delicious they are. And if I, this is why I do most of my grocery shopping via Instacart these days. If I go to the grocery store, I cannot resist grabbing it. If I walk through the bread aisle, it's a done deal. I'm grabbing it and I'm eating the whole thing probably in one sitting because you can't stop. They're so good. So good. So good. Donuts. Beautiful choice. Beautiful choice. Um, I'm going to go with kids using their manners uh, in little grown up <laughs> mature ways. Yes. I love that. <laughs> so, like, literally, like, just like opening a cheese stick wrapper. And like a joyful like manner manners, you know, so like I open up a cheese stick for my son. He's like, thank you, daddy. You know, not like, thanks, daddy. <laughs> like there's like joy behind it. Like he really appreciated me doing that. And then and because the, the Asher seven Edie's three. And so that that just like brings a spark to my day. And I'm like, yes, they're getting it. They're going to be kind people. <laughs> yeah. So the other day, um, my two year old Marshall said, Thanks for making dinner, Daddy. Oh. And I was like, yes. I was like, thank you. That was amazing. You just gave me the greatest gift. It's just, it's so sweet. You're right on. You're right on the money there. I love it. Okay, my number three. This is a, this is a figurative little thing. I love when you like open a new jar of peanut butter and you pull the seal off and it comes off perfectly. You know what I'm talking about? Or mm-hmm. it, this doesn't have to just be peanut butter like anything that has one of those like little protective seals on it you pull it off and also like um like a sticker on a dvd case or something like that you pull it off and it just comes off perfectly clean that is so satisfying i don't even know why but it is it's just like it's it is just euphoria (laughs) Mm -hmm. in its purest Mm -hmm. form you're just like man that felt really nice i think with the sticker thing it's because the alternative is hell the (laughs) alternative The alternative is the sticker has ripped and you have to painstakingly scrape it off, get the goo gone. Like it's just terrible. It's terrible. And so I think just seeing it come off clean, you're like, ah, thank God. But it it is just so nice. I love it. Yes. Beautiful. Um, My number four or my fourth schoolyard pick here. Um, I'm going to pick someone surprising you. I like being surprised apparently. Uh, mostly by the tiny buttons on the remote, but we'll get back to that later. <laughs> Someone surprising you by completing a task on your to-do list. Yep. Yes. I often have very long to-do lists and some, you know, you prioritize them uh, for things that matter the most. You start with safety and then you go next to a deadline, something that's out of your control that you have to meet, right? And then so on and so forth. And if something gets taken off my list, and like whether this it's at work or at home, dude, it's like so refreshing. Yeah, that's <laughs> amazing. So that's nice. an amazing feeling. It is an amazing feeling. Yeah, so that's I my love next that. One. Yeah, my wife did that today. Did the grocery list. I was like, man, we're running out of food, and then I was like, man, I got to run to a meeting. I added some stuff to the grocery list. Then she texted me while I was in my meeting and was like, hey, groceries ready to go just hit order on instacart and i was like oh my gosh this is amazing i don't have to think about that anymore it's it's a great feeling that's a good one good one underrated okay my fourth pick i'm going with handheld gaming systems i have loved this for as long as i can remember since i was a tiny baby playing my game boy color my game boy advance my you know, my, my Nintendo DS, my PSP, all these different things. I just love it. There's something so nice about like sitting on an airplane or, you know, just being able to have a little mobile gaming device, even like phones now these days. I play tons of phone games. I just love it. It lets you shut off your brain completely. You can take a boring situation and make it fun and it really kills the time. So I'm a big fan of handheld gaming systems. Shout out to the Sega Game Gear. This is the first handheld gaming system I can remember having. I had this um, Sega, man. They were way ahead of their time before they stopped making consoles. But they had the Game Gear. And there was this Power Rangers. 
like Mortal Kombat style fighting game on there. Yes. It was just the sickest thing, and we played it nonstop. I still, I have such great memories about that game and about the Sega Game Gear. I remember exactly how it feels in my hands. So, got to go with handheld gaming consoles. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. All right, I'm on my last one yep. for my schoolyard pick of little things. <laughs> I'm gonna go with. This is a little thing, but man, does it go a long way. Random acknowledgement of hard work. Like, kind of like, I see you. I see you. I see what you did there, you know? Yeah. Um, and so I, I try to let people know that, too, because I love it so much. You know, you, there are the five love languages. And um, if you pay attention enough, you'll figure out what everyone else's is because they're going to be treating you the way they want to be treated, right? So, yep. And then, you're, then you obviously, then you never ultimately treat them the way they want to be treated because you're treating them the way you want to be treated. And that's the whole cycle of life. And that's why we have conflict. That's why there's so many. <laughs> I'm just cracking just spin, down. Right now, I'm the Winona Ryder dream, the Winona Ryder gif where the numbers are flying around your head. That's me right now. <laughs> I'm just solving the human condition right now. I'm laying it all <laughs> out there, right there. Um, yeah. So, so um, uh, someone said, you know, it, it, what again? Work or at home? Like, hey, hey, thanks for doing that. Or, man, you spent all day on this, and it looks great, even if it doesn't. And yeah. Uh, uh, it's just it's just cool. It's just cool to to see that play out. Yeah, I love it. It's it's one hundred percent right. Um, man, my picks are like so shallow in comparison to yours. Yours are like philosophical, and I'm like donuts. <laughs> 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 which is a perfect lead into my last pick, which is hold on, hold on, hold on. Before you go with the yeah, last one, sure. Who's to say that donuts are not philosophical? Hey, man? I it's. Mean- my love language is miniature donuts. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> um, my last one is cheeseburger sliders. I love them. There was a time, Kirk, and I don't like to think about this time, but there was a time where many restaurants, specifically chain sit-down restaurants, did not have sliders on their menu. And there has been a slider renaissance and everybody has it. It's a staple. You got to have sliders. Sometimes they have sautéed onions. Sometimes they have bacon. Sometimes you can add whatever you want to them. Sometimes you can make a double stack sliders that have less bun mm-hmm. and more patty. That I mean, that's amazing. Mm-hmm. I love the slider. I'm a big fan. It feels like you're getting more food for your money. It's you're not. I don't think, but it just really does feel that way, and it gives you exit ramps. You know, if you're like, if you are. Um, you know, two thirds into an eight ounce burger and you're feeling full, like you're not going to save that. There's no way. But if you just knocked out two sliders and you got two more and you're like, I'm feeling full, box those babies up, reheat them, <laughs> done deal. It oh, just, that's so good. Yeah, it's the best. I love sliders. They're, they are one of the great food inventions ever. It's like some, who, who was the Leonardo da Vinci of sliders mm. who was like, it's a burger but small and more of them. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> <laughs> like the big bang. It's just so incredible. Um, yeah. Shout out to sliders. That's my final pick. That inspired me for one honorable mention. Okay. Every let's hear time, it. every time I go to a restaurant, there was a fad and I don't know why this ever died. It was basically like a, um, a, a mini dessert of everything. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. you know, normally when they bring out restaurant desserts, it's like so much that you want to vomit when you're looking at the picture because it's just sugar overload, right? So yep. they'll bring you an entire eight serving cake for five ninety nine. You're like, okay, why not? I'll eat that whole thing right now after I ate all my sliders, you know? No, they brought these like I, I forget what they called them, but they're just like mint, like literally like like this big, like it's in a shot glass, and you get a tiny spoon, and you have a little tiny sundae or whatever it might be, whatever kind of specialty they had. It was the greatest dessert fad in the history of the restaurant. It business. sounds incredible. And it sounds. I want incredible. them to bring it back. They should. They should. Why does that not? Why is that not a thing? That needs to be a I thing. That needs to be a thing everywhere. This is this is ridiculous. I did. Uh, I did travel uh, over to a restaurant called uh, the Fountains uh, over in the next state over mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. several months ago, <laughs> and we discovered by by happenstance that they had they still did this. So they they know the heart of their customers. They understand it, um, and so uh, I expect that from every restaurant now. You love to see it. 
Um, that's good. That was a good, that was a fun schoolyard pick. Um, and that is our show. So thank you guys so much for listening to this episode. If you're new to the program, thank you very much. If you want to learn more about us and what we do and what we have been doing for the last year and a half, you can find out more on popcornforbreakfast.com. That's popcorn, the number four breakfast.com. You could check us out on all of our social media channels. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We've got a YouTube channel with tons of videos and we actually have a new video series that I mentioned earlier in the episode called Spilled Popcorn. Kirk's going to spill the popcorn again. Yep, spill it out. Spill it everywhere. And we are walking through WandaVision right now. We're going to continue to do episodes, recaps of television shows, and lots of fun stuff on that. Um, so you can check it out there. And, you know, we've got more on our website, as I said, but we've got lots more coming, I believe, next time we may be reviewing Malcolm and Marie, which drops on Netflix this Friday, starring Zendaya and John David Washington. That's definitely the leader in the clubhouse at the moment. If you have other suggestions for movies we should check out, hit us up. You know where to reach us on social media. Um, but other than that, thank you guys so much for listening. want to give a special thank you to our executive producer, Ryan Spriggs. And our original music is by the band Rhetoric. Let's listen to it play out, and we will see you guys next week. Talk to you then.